Hello, Pastor Gavin Whitcomb Sr. from Moore's Mountain Church near Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Are you ready to dig into the Word? So am I. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks, Lord, for all the things that you've done for us, all the many blessings. We ask you to bless as we study your Word, open our understanding, and guide us by your Holy Spirit. Teach us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are going through the book of Philippians, verse by verse, and uh, we're in chapter 1 right now. And so we're going to cover verses 9 through 11 of chapter 1, and let me just read those for you here. It says, And this I pray, that your love may abound, yet more and more, in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense, till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, under the glory and praise of God. Now, the Apostle Paul, in, in these three verses, he's saying, hey, this is what I'm praying for you guys. And this I pray, and then he goes on to say what he prays for them. Now, uh, what, the, what we have to understand is our scripture reading this morning, this is Paul's prayer for them. But what relevance is that for us? Well, uh, if that's what Paul prayed for them and God wanted that for their lives, well, it's God's will for believers today, for you and for me. So now I want you to think about this. It kind of puts it into perspective. Okay, Christianity is about the restoration of our relationship with God that was broken because of our sin, right? And, uh, and Jesus died so that we could be forgiven and reconciled. But uh, Christianity is also about life. Through Christ, we are raised from a state of spiritual death to a state of spiritual life. And the eternal life of God is placed within us when we repent and we believe on Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. And so just as a healthy, living thing grows... The Lord wants us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, rather than grow, the Apostle Paul uses the term to abound. Uh, and, and so the word abound means, you know, you increase so that there's a lot. Uh, and, and so he says, in this I pray, and, and as, uh, th that your love may abound yet more and more, in knowledge and in all judgment. So so he wants these things to abound in them. And basically in this passage of scripture, it comes down to three things, uh, three areas of the Christian life in which we should desire to grow and experience an abundance, that it would grow and abound more and more. Okay, the first area is in love. He says, in this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more. Uh, now that's a good thing to want to grow in love, right? And uh, Jesus taught that the two greatest commandments are to love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself, right? And he said on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, or as it's stated elsewhere in scripture, all of the law is fulfilled in this, to love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, certainly the Lord would want us to grow in our love for him and our love for the Lord to abound more and more. But I think the context here points to the fact that he's primarily talking about our love for one another. Now, biblical love, when he says that your love may abound yet more and more, what is, what is love like? How does the Bible mean that? Well, biblical love is more than a feeling. Now, the feelings might and often do accompany it, but love in the Bible is an attitude with accompanying actions. It's an attitude with accompanying actions that says to others, I want what is best for you. So it's treating others according to the requirements of God's word, uh, doing what's best for others without the motive of personal gain. And uh, this kind of love is commanded by God and uh, it's a choice, like we can choose to love. And uh, the, the description of this kind of love that God talks about 
is described in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. And in this description of love, it's, it's more of a working practical definition of love rather than a dictionary definition, if you know what I'm saying. So he gives his description and he says, charity, and uh, the King James translators translated it charity to let us know it's the highest form of love, agape love. But I'm going to uh, say it the way we do in modern terminology. Love suffereth long. So it's long-suffering, patient with others. And is kind. So it is a loving thing to be kind. Kind means we're good to others. And uh, we need to be kind in our thoughts and our words and also in our deeds. We need to be kind in our attitudes as well. Then he says, love envieth not. Love is glad when things are going well for somebody else. Love vaunteth not itself, doesn't brag and boast, is not puffed up. So love isn't prideful and arrogant. It's humble and cares about others. Love doth not behave itself unseemly. In other words, it isn't rude and (coughs) ill-mannered. It seeks to treat others properly. Seeketh not her own. In other words, love isn't self-centered, just, oh, I want what I want. Who cares about anybody else? No, love doesn't seek her own, is not easily provoked. In other words, slow to anger, slow to wrath, right? Quick to forgive. The next phrase, love thinketh no evil. You know, the word thinketh is the Greek word logizomai, and uh, it's an accountant term. So the idea is love doesn't keep track of wrongs and hold grudges. In other words, love thinketh no evil. In other words, love forgives. Love doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. There's some people, their idea of love is, if you know somebody that's living in sin, the loving thing to do is to affirm them in their life of sin and say, well, I love you, so it's all right if you live a wicked life. No, love doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. So love would encourage people to do what's right um, rather than be glad that they're engaging in iniquity. And then it says, love beareth all things, believeth all things. Uh, so so to bear all things, it, there's an enduring quality about it that even though it may not be easy to love some people, love continues on, right? And love believeth all things. In other words, we're willing to believe the best about others unless there's some evidence pointing otherwise. Love hopeth all things, you know, uh, can can continue to hope for the best, and endureth all things. So uh, not quick and easy to give up is is, uh, biblical love. Okay, so now he, he says, This I pray that your love may abound yet more and more. Well, if we want our love to abound more and more, how do we do that? Well, We grow and abound in love by learning and practicing God's principles in his word. Because God's commandments teach us how to love God and how to love our neighbor, right? So you learn biblical principles and you apply them. You will grow and abound in love. But also by walking in the spirit. Since love is a fruit of the spirit, right? And so to walk in the spirit means we walk in obedience to God's word yielded to the influence and guidance of the Holy Spirit who is within us. And uh, Galatians 5.16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit. And Galatians 5.22-26 through 26 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Temperance means self-control. Um, and, and so if we live in the Spirit, he says, let us also walk in the Spirit. So if we are being led and directed and guided and we're filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God will produce that love within us as a part of the fruit of the Spirit. So that's how uh, lo- God's love may abound more and more in us. All right, so, so he says, this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more, but there's something within the context of what? In knowledge and in all judgment. In knowledge and in all judgment. 
and knowledge and judgment go hand in hand. Knowledge of what? Well, a knowledge of God and of his truth and of his principles. And judgment refers to discernment, the ability to look at things and discern whether they're true or false, whether they're good or evil. Uh, and, and so he wants us to grow in discernment that, uh, in, in all knowledge. He wants us this love to abound in all knowledge and in all judgment. Now, you know, so, so he wants us to have discernment. Love does not mean that we overlook or excuse sin and evil. And the Lord doesn't want us to be naive and gullible and easily deceived. So he wants us to have discernment and wisdom. Now, uh, to do that, we have to have a knowledge of the truth. And God's word is our source of truth, right? And the more knowledge we learn of his truth, the more capable we are of distinguishing being between what's true and false and between what's right and wrong. I mean, if you don't know what's true, well, then how do you know something's false? If you, don't know, if you don't know the truth about something, how can you tell if something's right or wrong? So we get that knowledge of right and wrong and of truth and of righteousness and goodness. We get that from God's word. So if we want our love, uh, if, if we want this love to abound in, all, in knowledge and in all judgment, then we need to uh, make a serious effort to try to learn God's word and study his word and learn God's principles. So, uh, th so being able to tell the difference between what's true and false and right and wrong, that's the meaning of the word judgment here, or discernment. Uh, now, when we talk about judging things and being able to discern, you know, we don't want to be deceived and, you know, naive and easily misled and easily deceived, but if we know the truth, the truth is the antidote to deception and to lies. And there's a lot of lies and deception in this world, a lot of false ideas, false philosophies. We can see through them if we know the truth. Now, th this word judgment, you know, there are a lot of people that misunderstand and misapply Jesus' statement when it comes to judgment. You know, in Matthew 7, Remember, Jesus said, judge not that ye be not judged. So a lot of times when we as Christians condemn evil conduct, sometimes people will say to us, well, we're not to judge, or judge not that ye be not judged. And uh, so they quote the words of Jesus, but they, they misunderstand the meaning and quote it out of context. You know, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus did not condemn any and all forms of judgment, judging. He was, he was uh, condemning hypocritical and self-righteous judgment. In other words, uh, people think they're good and they don't have any faults, and so they take delight in uh, pointing out the faults of others and condemning and criticizing others. And so that's, that's, uh, that's self-righteous judgment. And certainly that would be condemned, but also hypocritical judging. Jesus said, judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So there is that, hey, we ought to, we ought to have some humility and uh, not be self-righteous and not be so quick to condemn others because we're not perfect either. But he says, why beholdest thou the mote? that's a speck of wood in or sawdust that's in thy brother's eye, but considers not the beam that's in thine own eye. So the idea is that, and this is a hyperbole, you have this big beam or this big telephone pole sticking out of your eye, but you're concerned about getting a speck of sawdust out of your neighbor's eye. Why don't you get that telephone pole or that log or that beam out of your eye first and then worry about your neighbor's speck of sawdust in his eye. Uh, and and uh, he says, How about thou say to my brother, Let me pull out the mote, mote out of thine eye. Behold, a beam is in thine own. Thou hypocrite. See, this is hypocritical judging. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote 
out of thy brother's eye. So this hypocritical and self-righteous judgment. You know, if someone's living a wicked life, yeah, they better not judge because they'll bring judgment upon themselves. Um, and, and I believe this, that God will be more merciful towards us in his dealings with us if we're more merciful towards others. Uh, um, you know, he says, with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. So um, that's the lesson there. But as further proof that Jesus was not condemning any and all judging. You know, Matthew 7 is where he said, judge not that ye be not judged. Well, later on in Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20, Jesus says this, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Wouldn't you have to judge in order to do that? Yes. But that wouldn't be self-righteous or hypocritical judging. This would be judging that involves discernment, right? Uh, that, that, you know, your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. This sense of judgment or discerning. He says, uh, do men gather, gather grapes uh, from thorns or figs from thistles? And of course, no. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt, meaning a rotten tree, brings forth uh, evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, it's chopped down, and cast into the fire. And so unsaved people live wicked, godless lives, and they're a corrupt tree. They bring forth corrupt fruit, fruit. One day God's going to cut them down and they're going to be thrown into the fire, a reference to hell. So he says, wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. You know, to a certain degree, not perfectly, but to a certain point, we can judge what's in people's hearts by their fruits, by what comes out their mouth, uh, the kind of actions they perform. So uh, what we do and what we say, the way we act, reveals what's in our hearts. So it's, my point is this. It is not wrong to judge. Uh, you know, the same chapter where Jesus said, Judge not that you be not judged, referring to hypocritical self-righteous judging. In the very same chapter, he says, Beware of false prophets, by their fruits ye shall know them. So see, there's no inconsistency with uh, between a wrong kind of judging and the right kind of judging using discernment. Now, in Hebrews 5, it tells us that having a sense of discernment, not being easily deceived or misled, uh, seeing through things that are lies and erroneous because you know the truth, that's a sign of spiritual maturity. Let me read to you Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. Now he's kind of rebuking them and he says, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. You guys ought to be at the place where you ought to be teaching other people, but you need to be taught the little baby elementary things of what God has spoken. That's what he means by the oracles of God, the word of God. And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Okay, so some people are baby Christians, spiritually babies. Their growth is stunted, and they can't handle strong meat and solid doctrine, strong doctrine, right? But strong meat belongs to them that are full age. Full age means mature. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Okay, now notice that. How are mature people described? Well, they can handle the meat of the word, not just the milk. And they have their senses exercised to discern between good and evil. You see, 
We're to, we're to exercise our senses. We're to look at all the world around us through the lens of God's word, and we are to judge things. Do they line up with God's word or do they not? If they contradict God's word, they're not true. And if they go against God's principles, they are not good. They're evil, right? And, and so our love needs to bound in knowledge and in all judgment. So it's knowledge that helps us to see through lies uh, and equips us to see through the lies of this world. And, and knowledge and of the truth is the antidote to believing lies and to being deceived. Now, uh, he, he says uh, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Verse 10, that ye may approve things that are excellent. What does he mean by that? Well, we look at things, we judge them on the basis of what God's word says. And the things that line up with God's word, we give our approval to them. In other words, when we learn God's ways, we are in agreement with him. So we feel the same way about things that God feels about them. So with this knowledge and this judgment and this love for God and love for others, it gives us the ability to look at things. And since we're in agreement with God, we approve the things that God does, the things that are excellent. Excellent means they excel or go beyond and above, in a better sense, anything on this earth. And so you see, God's ways are excellent because their value and their beauty far surpass and exceed the things of this world. You know, that's kind of like what Romans 12, 2 is getting at, although it says it in just a little different way, from kind of a, the same truth, but from a sort of a different angle. He says, be not conformed to this world. Don't let the ungodliness of the age in which we live in shape you into its mold. Don't give in to the bunch of the nonsense and uh, sinfulness and uh, wickedness of this world. Don't let the world rub off on you. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Let God change you. How? By the renewing of your mind. So what do we mean? Well, we renew our mind with what? With God's truth. We, um, as a process of spiritual growth and learning, we uh, learn to recognize ways of thinking that are not in line with God's word. We bring our thinking in line with God's truth. And so our mind is renewed with God's truth. And he says, when we do that, do that, that ye may prove. Prove means test, evaluate examine that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So when we give our heart and our mind to the Lord and we learn his truth and we apply it to life and we examine things, we are able to prove or test or evaluate what what God's will, if something is God's will or if it's not. And if it's God's will, it's good and acceptable and perfect. Now, he, he says... Uh, that ye may be, that ye may approve things that are excellent, and and this is um, a part then of the third thing we're to grow in, and that's fruits of righteousness. He says that ye may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. So in other words, hey, we should seek to live a life of sincerity and without offense. Now, what's sincerity? Well, that's genuineness. In other words, being the same whenever everybody's looking at us as we are when we are in private. When we're in private, just between ourselves and the Lord, we're living a godly life. We're doing what's right, whether anyone's looking the other way or watching us or not, because we're sincere. We're the same genuine Christian. We truly seek to live the Christian life away from home as well as at home, inside and out. And uh, so that's sincerity, genuineness, not, not putting on a show and trying to act real good and holy when people are around and then when no one else is looking, live wicked as the devil. No, this is sincerity, that you may be uh, sincere, he says, and without offense. 
without offense. The word offend here is the old English word that means to stumble. So in other words, hey, we should want to live a life of sincerity and, and not want to stumble spiritually. Now, how can we keep from stumbling spiritually? Well, one way is to love the Word of God. And if we love the Word of God, not only loving to learn it, but loving to live it and to put it into practice. Psalm 119, verse 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. So if you love God's word and you love it to learn it and you love to live it and to practice it and to live by it, it gives you peace. And nothing shall offend you. It'll cause you, it, it, it'll help to prevent you from stumbling spiritually, from falling into sin. Now, it says here that you may uh, be sincere and without offense. So live a life of sincerity and don't stumble spiritually till the day of Christ. What's the day of Christ? Well, until the day when Jesus comes back. Our goal should be, hey, we want to be sincere and faithful until Christ returns. And, you know, we find that that as believers, we are to uh, look and watch and wait and look forward to the day of Christ when Christ returns. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, it says that our, our conversation, which here means citizenship, is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so... You know, Paul told the Thessalonians how you, you Thessalonians, you turn from God. I mean, you turn from idols. You turn to God from idols, I meant to say, to serve the true and living God and to wait for his son from heaven, right? That's a part of the Christian life. And so he's saying, hey, you know, I, I, my prayer is that you would be sincere and without offense till the day of Jesus Christ. So, now, uh, he says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Now, what are the fruits of righteousness? Well, that refers to anything, any and all things that deal with living a godly life. That, and in other words, godliness uh, that, that the Lord produces in us. He says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Well, you want to find out what some of the fruits of righteousness are. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, right? You remember we read that. Um, and certainly influencing other people for good and for the sake of the gospel and the kingdom of God. Uh, and and uh, notice that these fruits of righteousness, he says, which are by Jesus Christ. Under the glory and praise of God. These fruits of righteousness, we can't take the credit for them. They're by Jesus Christ because Christ saved us and came into our lives and changed us. Well, isn't that the work of the Holy Spirit? Yes, but it's also Christ living within us. Paul said, I, um, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live by the uh, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, in Philippians 2, 13, there's a passage of scripture. I love this verse. It says, it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Did you catch that? If you do what pleases God, it's because God's working in you. But also to will to do of his good pleasure is the result of God working in you. Where do you and I who are saved and love the Lord and have this desire to please God, where does that come from? Well, it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So when he says being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, 
You see, Christ is the one who produces those. It's all because of what Jesus has done and how he saved us and transformed us. He says, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So through the change that has taken place in the fruits of righteousness to which he uh, creates within us and grows within us, for which we ought to want to abound more and more. Uh, these are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. The result in God getting the glory. So it's not anything that we've done. It's what God has done in us. And so to to bring glory and praise to God, that should be the goal of our lives. Remember 1 Corinthians 10.31? It says this, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So even in everything, even in the most mundane tasks, whether ye eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. How can we glorify God with our life? Well, live in a way that pleases him. And and a life of praise since where we where we seek to honor God and we um live uh, fulfilling the purpose for which he's created us to glorify him and doing whatever he made you and built you to do, using your gifts and abilities in so, such a way that he is pleased. May the Lord bless you and keep you and lift up his countenance upon you, and may he give you peace. Amen.